My Redeemer, together as we worship our Savior this morning, 163 in your church this morning on time. Yay. Yeah. Good to have you here today on Time Change Sunday. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for the privilege it's ours to gather together uh, in your house. Lord, I pray that you'd be honored and glorified uh, in this place and Lord, more specifically by each of our heart attitude toward you, toward your word. May we receive your word with gladness this day. We ask, Lord, if there be any among us that don't know you as a personal Lord and Savior, that they would trust you today. And then, Lord, we also ask that you would encourage those of us who do know you. Be with our friends, our missionary evangelist friends who are proclaiming the gospel around the world today. We pray you'd give them blessed meetings and gatherings as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now you may be seated. <coughs>
stand. Turn to 32. I sing the mighty power of God as the choir goes down. Let's worship and sing about his mighty power. And this great hymn of the faith from Isaac Watts. I sing the mighty power. 32. So uh, thank you, fellas, that, that joined us, and young fellas. And if uh, you, you missed it, I hope that you'll make a point to join us for our next one uh, down the road. Uh, tomorrow night is the couple's night out. That's at the Chop House in uh, Washington uh, Township over there, Centerville area. And we'll meet there at 6 p.m. We've reserved the fireside room. So when you get there, that, that will be if you ask for, I think it's under my, the reservations in my name or the, the church group. They'll know who you are. Uh, we're in the back back uh, section there, uh, and so uh, we'll meet there at 6 p.m. And if you would like to go with us, we'd love to have everybody uh, go that wants to. We've still got several uh, tables available. At least when I walked by the bulletin board uh, some while ago, there were still quite a few spots there. So I hope that you'll join us if you can. Good time just to uh, spend together uh, as uh, couples and enjoy a meal, meal out. Uh, this Saturday will be the team bowling activity. I don't have times on that, Pastor Brent. Do you? Uh, here at the church, 8.30, we'll be back by 11. 8.30 to 11, all right, here at the church. And so uh, they had to go a little earlier because of uh, bowling uh, bowling leagues, I guess, that are that occupy a lot of the time there on Saturday afternoon. So that'll be this Saturday. They're, they're, the workers can still work Saturday. And if they already have the time off, parents, we can come up with a chore list. They've got the afternoon to work, so this is fantastic. Some of you are a little tired, I can tell. All right, but we're glad glad you're here. A lot of other things on the other side of your bulletin there that I hope you take note of and participate in everything uh, that you that you can. My folks are up in Michigan uh, this uh, this weekend. My mom spoke at a ladies' meeting up there yesterday, and so they're going to spend a few days up there. They got three or four inches of snow overnight, so. The flurries we had here, no big deal, all right? So we'll, we'll uh, but they're, they're enjoying their time up there. Thank you for praying, pray for them. All right, we'll have our ushers come, receive our offering this morning. I see Brother Brad's the best dressed of the game, so we'll, we'll ask you to pray for us, sir, would you? Good gracious Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. Thank you so much for the privilege and honor and being with you. 
pray you to help us to apply to our heart and lives, Lord God. Pray to be with the Union Church in the back, Lord, and I just pray that uh, your will be done there. And thank you so much for the privilege given us to, uh, to give, Lord God, and we thank you for your blessings there and help us to give yes. uh, to further the gospel, Lord God. And we just thank you so much for that and give you the praise and honor, Lord, for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Miss Griggs. One of our faithful teachers here, thankful for, for her and thankful for the message of the song that she just sang for us. Let's turn to Acts chapter 21. Acts 21. The title of today's, this morning's message is uh, The Will of the Lord Be Done. The Will of the Lord Be Done. Let's uh, notice, if you would, if you're able, if you'll stand, we'll just read the first three verses. We'll look at the first 14 this morning. That's my, my plan. Uh, but let's notice the first three together. Actually, let's back up and catch the last verse of chapter 20, verse 38 there. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them, and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coas, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went, ab went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand, and sailed into Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to be unlaid, was to unlaid her burden. The will of the Lord be done. Father, help us, I pray, as we, would, as we look at this portion of Scripture, this first section of Acts 21, I pray that we'd see truth that would be a challenge to us as we, Lord, would consider the fact that we need to be busy about your business, that we would accomplish the will that you desire for us. Lord, I pray that you'd give us guidance into the truth, challenge our hearts, or give me wisdom clarity of thought and mind to deliver the message according to your will. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Paul, as we looked at last week, is determined, he is resolved to finish the course that God has called him to do. And this first third of, chap of, chap of this chapter uh, summarizes Paul's journey back to Jerusalem where, where he is headed. Uh, the path that he's about to, to enter is going to get difficult. And he's going to be reminded several times along the way of the hardship and trials that await him. Yet he's going to press on in faithfulness to God. The question would be why? Because the, the, the message that we are called as God's people to deliver, the message of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is more important, more significant than any hardship we may face. And the Apostle Paul understood that. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He would pen to the church at Philippi. And we need to be pressing on for God. The gospel of Christ must be proclaimed. And so the Apostle Paul is going forward in it, in it, on, on the course that, that God has for him. We'll reference this. I, I plan to reference this later in the message, but I want to remind us of way back earlier in the, chapter, er, in the early chapters of the book of Acts when, when, Paul was, when Saul was saved and God changed his name to Paul and uh, that Ananias was a little apprehensive about Paul coming, you know, and the Lord saying, yeah, I receive him. And, and one of the things the Lord told Ananias was, uh, I'm going to show him the great things he must suffer for me, for my sake, for the cause of Christ. So the Apostle Paul entered the ministry understanding that his journey for Christ, the will of God for his life, was going to take on some hardships. And so his going back to Jerusalem, although people are going to say, look, it's going to get hard, it's going to be difficult. And, and some, some uh, Bible students would argue that perhaps it was outside the will of, of God for Paul to go to Jerusalem. I think as we study this chapter, we're going to see that that's not the case. But uh, and I, don't think, I think Paul was in the will of God. I'll just go ahead and make that, make that clear. Uh, but there are going to be some things said here that we might get a little bit confused and go, wait a minute. It just kind of sounds like God's telling them not to do this. God is making sure that Paul understands the hardship that lay ahead of him if he's, if he's to, to go on this, this course. You know, some things in life are difficult, aren't they? We don't desire difficulty in our life, but we recognize in this life, because we're all under the curse of sin and, 
and life gets difficult. Life can be hard. We've, we've, got to, we've got to go forward in the midst of adversity or in the midst of hardship. When I was in high school, junior high really, I had uh, within me a desire to be around the farm life. Probably because of the way my dad has uh, romanticized it in many of his messages uh, through the years. I kind of developed that, that love or inherited that love for the farm life from him. And so I remember those days uh, when my parents came to Christ. We were living on a farm. And, and after that, when we would visit uh, one of my grandparents uh, my, on my mom's side, they, they had a farm of, I think, about 40 acres or something like that. And so I enjoyed those kinds of things. I enjoyed the, enjoyed the farm life. So in, in junior high, maybe early high school here, I think it was early high school, actually, I had the opportunity to, to, to work, uh, spend a summer working with a farmer in the area. And so I was excited about it. And some of you uh, can think back that far and remember what size I was at that point in my life. I mean, I think I weighed 135 pounds on a heavy day. All right. <laughs> I was, and I was tall, but I mean, I just, you, you don't, you wouldn't look at me and go, there's a farm kid. That's just not what you're going to sit and go think. But uh, I don't know what the farmer thought when he saw me, uh, but uh, he was, he was hard up for laborers. And so he gave me a shot. And so I went to work for, for this farmer and, and enjoyed it. He had a couple of young uh, sons that were in our school at the time, in elementary school here, and, and enjoyed working for him. One of the things I, I, I picked up early from him, and I, and I have never been one that shied away from hard work. I'm thankful for a dad that, that instilled that uh, in me as a young man. And, and, enjoyed, and then when you enjoy the work, it's not as hard as others might think it is. Just because you, you enjoy it. But one of the phrases, a couple phrases he would use almost daily, and in particular when his boys were around, there were two phrases he would use a lot. And one was, well, you're just going to have to get tough. And he had nicknames for his boys. He'd call them by their nickname, and he'd say, you know, uh, I won't say what they are out loud. They may be online, whatever. This is, and that may not be public information at these stages, you know. Some of us had nicknames when we were young, and we're thankful that our current population doesn't know them, right? So, uh, but he had nicknames for them. He called by their nickname and, and said, you know, you're going to have to get tough. And then, I mean, when it, when it, when, when the, the get tough speech wore off, it, when it really got difficult, when the task at hand was, I mean, it was really hot and we were all tired, hey, you're just going to have to bite the bullet and go on. Get tough, bite the bullet. I mean, and those phrases became part of my vernacular. You know, things you pick up around people that you just you don't realize are part of your vernacular. And so they did. Get tough. What's he talking about? You know, sometimes bailing hay when all the local media is telling everybody to stay inside in the air conditioning. We, I had people contact my mother and say, hey, you need to check on Jim. Make sure, well, it was Jimmy then. You need to check on Jimmy. Make sure. I mean, he shouldn't be out in this. this, this. I mean, we're bailing hay. We, he, he, what do they call those things? Heat... Uh, Heat advisories. We well, don't know anything about that. It's time to work, man. Get tough. Bite the bullet. Drink some more iced tea. Amen. Right? Uh, we just kept going. We, we knew it was going to be hard. We knew it was hard work, but we knew it was a task that needed to be done, so we, we went at it. You know, a lot of our lives sometimes, some, sometimes in our lives, we face similar situations, don't we? There may be tasks that we have to do or a season that we have to navigate. Some of you think every winter is a horrible season. You have to navigate, but I'm talking about other seasons in our life, maybe a health crisis or, or a financial difficulty, loss of a job, some of these things. They're, they're, they're stressful. They can be difficult. And, and how do we get through them? Uh, that American spirit that we've all come to admire of our forefathers, it, you get tough, you bite the bullet, you go forward. Well, that's really what I'd like for us to see here in Paul's life over the next few messages here in Acts. We see that Paul was willing to get tough. He was already tough. It was just got to be evidence. He was willing to bite the bullet if he had to be beaten for the cause of Christ and stoned and so on and so forth. Uh, he went forward for God. And nevertheless, or whatever the will, the will of God be, may, may it be done. The will of God be done. I want us to notice a few thoughts here from these first 14 verses. In the, in the text we read first to start with, these first three verses, I want us to consider the straight course. It went on a straight course, the Bible says. We, we launched a straight course unto, and then it talks about these stops they made along the way. And, and a straight course. Of course, straight is direct. 
It's focused. It's purpose. This, this, this is the destination we're headed to, and we took a straight course, a straight course. The, the Ephesian believers here held on as long as they could. The, the, the word, that, you know, like the phrase, the, the terminology that, that the Holy Ghost gives us, we were gotten from them. And it's almost like they had to, you know, you ever have a, a grand, some of you youngsters, some of you older ones that remember back, you ever have an aunt or a grandmother that would squeeze you so tight that you almost lost your breath and you're like, let like, go, oh, right? Or uh, I'm a preacher's kid and sometimes we would visit other people and some of you know that, you know, I enjoy hugging my, my wife and my kids um, and if close family members, you know, a hug is okay, but most other people, I'm just fine if you don't. Right, uh, hugs are reserved for a very special occasion with me, with, unless unless you're you're my my wife or, or a child. Right, that's the way I operate. But sometimes there are people that are huggers and they don't let go. You're like, let go, you know. Uh, this it says we, when we were gotten from them. Right now, I don't think that, that that Paul and Luke and the team were you know trying to get away from them, but I think the the idea here. Can you see the picture? Was that the, the, the Ephesian leaders, the leadership of the Ephesian church, didn't want to let go. We want to hold on to them as long as possible. I draw from that a principle we find in Proverbs. Proverbs are wise sayings. Proverbs 4.13, the Bible says, Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. You know, Paul and Luke and this team had been so instrumental in these Ephesian believers' lives that they didn't want to let them go. Well, I'm sure thankful that we hold the Word of God this morning. Thankful for this old King James Bible. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Uh, take fast hold of the Word of God. Don't, don't let it go. Don't compromise the truth for anyone or anything. Take fast hold of instruction. This was a, a straight course that they took, and I'm reminded of the fact that the, the Bible way, the straight and narrow way of God's Word is the best way. Follow the path of God's choosing for your life. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Look, we need to follow God's path for our life. God's way is a narrow way. It's in Christ. It's in His Word. But it's life. We're studying the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights. And since my father's out of town, I, the Lord's led me to preach from Revelation tonight. And we're beginning that section where the tribulation begins. Broad is the way which leads to destruction. It is devastating and, and somewhat difficult to study those those passages in the Word of God. But you know, those are the result of the sinfulness of man and his rejection of the narrow way, the simple way, the right way. It's Jesus Christ. And we as believers need to be careful that, that in our desire to, to, to reach everybody with the gospel, that we are not diluting our focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes we mistake our love of ourselves for love of other people. We want everybody to like us, so we compromise the truth. Oh, my friend, be careful. Be very careful about that. The straight course is the, the best course. I, I see also here something else that we pick up on in verse uh, 3. That Now, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria. I think about, about this truth that we can draw from this. You know, the memory of the just is blessed, the Bible tells us. Cyprus was where Barnabas was from. I don't know, but we might think that perhaps as that ship was sailing by there, that the Apostle Paul was out on the, the deck of the ship and looking over that location, that city, and, and thinking about the memories of his first missionary journey and how Barnabas had been so instrumental in his growing up in, in Christ and getting his feet wet uh, on, in, in missions and, and establishing and planting churches uh, for the cause of Christ. Uh, Barnabas was, was from Cyprus, and, and uh, Paul's first missionary journey began uh, from there. He had other fellow uh, believers, other, other fellow soldiers for the, for the cross of Christ that, that were uh, resided in that, that location. Uh, Paul's mind would have, would have been flooded with some precious memories. Aren't you thankful for good memories? Aren't you thankful for 
faithful ones that we can serve the Lord with. You know, the older we get in life, there's more of, more of those good memories are found about people that are already with the Lord. And praise the Lord they're with Him. That's a good thing. By the way, that's, that's the destination for every child of God. It's the desired destination for every, every human being to be with, with the Lord. And we don't like the process of getting there. It's difficult. We, we understand that. We don't, we don't like that process. But the, the, look, death, death is, should not be a threat for a child of God. Physical death is, is, a, is a, a translation. It's, a, it's an ending of this physical life, but it's the beginning of our eternal life in such a way that we've never known before. To be absent from the body is to be present, be present with the Lord. I'm thankful for good memories. And we ought to, to remind ourselves of, of, of good times. And, and as Paul was facing what he knew was going to be a very difficult time, you might think that perhaps tears would well up in his eyes as he, he passed by this place with memories of, of these people he'd served God with and probably memories of some people that they had seen uh, trust Christ there in, in, in that, that area. Uh, decide to follow the path of God's choosing. Stay on the straight and narrow way that God has chosen for, for you and me. How do we know what the straight and narrow way is? It's the Bible. Follow God's Word. We're united. We need to be united in Christ and united in the truth of His Word. Stay steadfast and true to the, the Word of God, to the old book, the straight course. Secondly, I want us to consider in verses 4 through 7, I've titled this point, The Search for a Church. Notice verse 4. And finding, so they got to, to uh, uh, Tyre, and they're going to be there for seven days. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that we should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all brought us on our way with the wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave, one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. When we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. I, 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 I want to draw your attention to the second word of verse 4. And finding. How did they find them? Now, we don't know specifically, but I would submit to you that uh, I think two things. One, I think the team was looking. And I would also like to just maybe read between the lines here a little bit and, and think that the disciples were also broadcasting who they were. The disciples there weren't hiding out, right? I don't know. Maybe they got off the ship and maybe there was a team that went from the local congregation there. They said, hey, there's a ship coming into town. Let's go down there and pass out some tracks. How did they find these disciples? I, the team was looking for other believers. They were looking to be a witness. And I think the believers there were looking for opportunities to share Christ with others. Look for opportunities to share Christ. They, were, they, were, they, they found a church. They were searching for a church. They, they were looking for God's people. So should you and I. They searched for an opportunity to be a blessing to others. They searched for an opportunity to serve. They, they spent seven days with them. And evidently they got a little bit attached. Right? There was another departure. doesn't say that they had gotten loose of them this time. Right? They weren't holding on so tight that they couldn't breathe. But uh, they, they, they got attached. They were serving together. Obey the truth that you know and trust God to guide your path. They, they, they found some disciples there that they could be a help to. And the disciples were a help to them. Look, they're, especially here in America, but really all over the world. If we would look, we could find other believers. Your life ought to be such a bright light for Christ that those around you know who you belong to. And it ought to be a blessing to you and to those you get acquainted with when you discover that you both know the Lord. That should be a blessing. It should be an encouragement. You know, it's, it's sometimes when, you know, when we're witnessing, we almost get a little frustrated when we find out the person we're witnessing to is already saved. You say, Pastor, you, you shouldn't say things like that. We, we shouldn't have that kind of spirit. I mean, just stay with me here, all right? 
Uh, you know, it, well, this is an opportunity. I might be able to win this portion of Christ. You start witnessing to them and discover they're already saved. Well, I guess that's not the one to get to lead to Christ this year or this week or this month or whatever your, your goal is or your intended purpose. But, hey, thank God they know the Lord. Amen. It's a wonderful thing to interact with people discover they know the Lord. Be iron sharpening iron. Be an encourager of others who do know the Lord. Paul and the team here got off this boat. They're there for a week, and they found some disciples. They found people who already knew Christ. Find people who know the Lord. How do you find them? You'll be a witness for Christ. Tell others about Jesus. Let others know that you know him. Obey the truth you know and trust God to give you, give you a direction uh, for where he would have you serve. Let me, let me make this, this point here before we move on to our next point. There are a lot of people who are hiding from serving God. Let me be more specific. There are a lot of God's people who are hiding from serving God. And what I mean by that is uh, a couple things. One, uh, they really don't want to serve, so they just kind of go, go uh, with the flow and just kind of stay in, stay in the shadows. There are others who will only serve if they have their spot, their desired spot. You know, there's all kinds of work to do for the Lord. There's uh, still tracks on the track rack back there. You can grab a handful of them and pass them out this week. That's serving the Lord. You can pray for God's work and God's power, God's presence to be realized. And every time we gather as God's people, you can do that consistently and regularly. You know, we're reminded of a couple of Bible characters who pray three times a day. You can pray for God's power and presence to be evidence in, in this place. Please pray for me. I covet your prayers. There are things we can be doing to serve the Lord, but a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I can't serve God because there's not an opportunity there for me. Well, usually what that means is I can't serve God the way I want to, so I'm not going to. Back the bus up. I can't serve myself and make other people think I'm serving God, so I'm not going to. Isn't that a more truthful statement for someone who would have a, an attitude? I, I can't serve the way I want to, so I'm not going to. So who are you serving? Right? The apostle Paul, he's, look, uh, Paul was a preacher. Paul was in the Sabbath row churches. He, fly, he gets off this boat. They're there for a week, and all of a sudden they find some other, other believers. Look, you know there are probably other believers in your workplace who are afraid to stand up for Christ because they don't think there are other believers in the workplace who would. Stand up for the Lord. Be a testimony for Christ. So we see the search for a church. And, and uh, next I want us to see in verses 8 and 9, the servant in Caesarea. Notice verse 8. And the next day, so maybe they're, they're bopping along here, all right? So the next day they, were, they that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. Remember him from back in chapter 8? Which was one of the seven, and abode with him, and the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. All right, let's think about this servant in Caesarea. Philip, he served God faithfully with his life. And some estimate this has been about 20 years since, since uh, we talked about him uh, earlier in, in the book of Acts. He spent his life, he's invested his life for God. Philip was one of the seven uh, first uh, uh, um, uh, deacons of the church there. I remember Stephen was also one of those deacons. One has to wonder how this meeting went between Philip and Paul. But Paul consented to Stephen's death. They would have gone out of the church there together to serve the Lord. And uh, 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 Stephen was stoned. Paul was consenting to his death. But, but, uh, but Philip had faithfully served the Lord. He was not only that evangelist that went out into the, the, the desert and won the Ethiopian that was searching for God. And we had that wonderful account there of, of uh, making sure that w before we would baptize someone that they have faith in Christ because baptism is not a savior. Baptism identifies one with the Savior. But Philip was obedient to the Lord. He faithfully served the Lord here in Caesarea. Uh, he, he, was, he was faithful to God. The Bible also tells us that his daughters were serving God. That's a wonderful testimony. We talk about a goal for every home. That our children would not only come to know Christ as Savior, but they would love him and serve him faithfully all their lives. 
Hey, parents, there's a prayer. There's a prayer you, you might want to add to your your prayer list for your your children. Or not only that they would come to know Christ, but that they would serve the, they would love the Lord and serve Him faithfully with their lives. Philip's daughters were were pure. The Bible records, and they prophesied. They they shared the truth of God's word. Hey, young person, who have you shared Christ with lately? Well, that's for the grown-ups. That's for you, Pastor. Yeah, it is for the grown-ups, and it is for me as your pastor, but it's for you, too. Philip's daughters were, 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 were sharing the truth of, of Christ. As a teenager, you can, be, you can be found faithful, and you ought to be. Well, I'm thankful for young people in our church that have a, a heart for God and are developing a desire and a passion for God to, to serve the Lord with their lives in whatever capacity God would choose. May we go forward for God. This servant in Caesarea, Philip, Philip was faithful to the Lord with his, with his life. We need to be sharing the truth of God with others. My question is, are you? Well, then I want us to focus for just a few moments on, on this final point. Four-point message this morning. We're still going to get done on time. You're welcome. Notice verse, verse uh, we read verse 10. Notice with me verse 11. And when he, this certain prophet Archibus, was come, he came unto us. He took Paul's uh, girdle. That would be the, the, uh, the, the, the belt, which would have been a cloth belt. Uh, I guess normally it would be wrapped around the waist a couple times and, and would cinch down the outer coat that, that an individual would wear in, in, in that time. All right? So uh, think about maybe a, a belt that would go around an overcoat, like a, 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 I'm thinking about a man's coat or a trench coat or something like that. It would, go around and we would be cinched up. So this would have been a part of his outer outer garment there, this this belt would go around. He in Argabus bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now I want to call your attention back up to verse uh, four, end of the verse, said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. So we've got two warnings here in just a few verses. Notice verse 12. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. So they're saying, don't go, don't go. There's going to be hardship there. Don't go. Verse 13. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. The will of the Lord be done. Paul remained resolute in his commitment to Christ. And the challenge to you and I today is, is are we resolute in our commitment to Christ? Do we have a commitment to Christ and to sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul said, I'm, I'm ready to go and not only be bound in Jerusalem, but I will die for the name of Christ. Paul had been shown in Acts chapter 9 and verse 16 is recorded for us, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul didn't enter the ministry ignorant of what was going to be required of him. But he was willing to go forward for God. He had set his course, as we saw back in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, but none of these things moved me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I know we preached through that verse some while ago, but I want to recall our attention to the fact that he said he wanted to finish with joy. Even though he knew he was going to suffer, he was going to finish his course with joy. How is that possible? It's only in Christ. It's only in, with the filling of the Spirit of God. I don't know if you've read any of the stories of some of the martyrs of years past. And by the way, we have a book on the table back here that, that uh, Pastor Paul Chappell wrote. It's, it's title, I think his title is The Outsider's. And goes through some of the accounts of their lives and, and, and how they were faithful to God to the end, even though martyred for the cause of Christ and, and uh, willing to suffer for Christ. And, and how God would minister to them even in those hours of, 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 of need before they, they, they exited in this life. They were faithful to God. Paul wanted to finish his course with joy, and we see that continuing in his life. He's going to go forward for God. He set his course. You know, in Philippians, 
He would declare a success. The church at Philippi was, you know, we call that the joy, joy book of the Bible. But Paul encouraged them. They were burdened for the apostle Paul. And he said in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, he said this, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. But Paul wasn't going to go suffer for naught without a cause. He was, he was suffering for the furtherance of the gospel, and the gospel was going forward because Paul was fulfilling the will of God for his life. These brothers and sisters here said, the, the will of the Lord be done. May the Lord's will be done in your life. Look, what is your desire? Paul's desire was to finish his course with joy, to go forward for God. He was resolute. He was re resolved as we look, uh, looked at last week. He, he was going to finish the course God had chosen for him. Paul was, was resolute in his commitment to Christ, even though he was being reminded of the dangers that, that awaited him with this uh, belt uh, illustration. And Luke and the other bro brothers there were, were uh, trying to trying to, to, to challenge him. Yet they said, the will of the Lord be done. None of us would question the commitment of the Apostle Paul, would we? My question for us this morning is this. To what or to whom are we committed? Maybe a different way to ask that same question or a similar way would be, what are you willing to suffer for? You know, I've known people with a tremendous work ethic, as I've shared earlier about this farmer. I've known people that would go, they would lose sleep, much sleep for many seasons of, uh, of life to work a lot of overtime or to accomplish a great task or, or get, get a job uh, complete. And we, we would have admiration for people that would have such a, such a commitment to a, to a task. And, and you think about, think about all the things we, we, we can invest our lives in, maybe better said, all the things we do invest our lives in. What about the cause of Christ? Paul was committed to share Christ with someone, another someone, even though he's incarcerated. He was going back to Jerusalem. He, he believed that's where God would have him to go. And we'll see later that I believe that's where God, God had him to go as well. Paul was, was, was faithful. He was committed to the course that God had chosen to him for him. The Bible tells us that our lives are similar to that of a vapor. Appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. You know, a long life is but a brief time in comparison to eternity, isn't it? As some saint of yesteryear said, only one life to live, only one life to give. Only what's done for Christ will last. The Apostle Paul invested most of his life, as soon as he got saved, the rest of his life, his saved life, was invested for the cause of Christ. Do you know, friends, that we benefit from Paul's commitment today? Most of the New Testament was penned by the Apostle Paul under inspiration of God the Holy Ghost. Are you thankful for the Apostle Paul's commitment? By the way, if you enjoy verses such as Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you could be thankful that the Apostle Paul was committed to Christ and penned those for us. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It was penned by the Apostle Paul. We know it's the eternal word of God, but it, it came to the vessel of a committed child of God, the Apostle Paul. He was determined to complete God's will for his life. What course are you taking? Would you choose the straight course, the best course that God has for you? Would you commit to be more faithful to the Lord and the, the course God, God has for your life? Are you searching for God's course? Are you searching for God's will? Are you searching for God's opportunities to share Christ with others, or are you hiding from them? Are you that person, maybe in the church, it would be kind of like in the classroom, in school, 
that when the teacher asked a question, you kind of hid behind somebody else's head so the teacher couldn't see you. Some people serve God that way. Oh, we need volunteers for this. Oh, oh. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I need to go to the restroom. Well, somebody send me a text when they're done getting those volunteers filled up. Okay. <laughs> now, the Apostle Paul wasn't shying away from, from opportunities to serve God, even if it required difficulty. Look, I'm thankful to be serving the United States of America, aren't you? I'm thankful for our missionaries that serve in the regions beyond, and we, although we have some in very difficult countries. Few, few of people, few of the people we know are serving at risk today. That may change. It could change tomorrow. I know. I'm concerned about some of the things going on in our country. I think anybody with, with a biblical brain would have to be. I'm thankful for the freedoms we have enjoyed in our lifetime to to proclaim the gospel, to freely worship the Lord. Maybe a question that we should ask ourselves is this. Would you continue to serve and faithfully gather if it were if you had to do so under threat? Well, that's for those people in those other places. And, and it is. Should they faithfully gather even under threat? Here's a question some of you are arguing with yourself in your mind right now about. You need to get in the book. The Apostle Paul was willing to be bound and even die for the cause of Christ. In the will of God. We're not talking about stepping out in front of a bus and seeing if God's going to protect us. Uh, you know, a bus running down the road. We're not talking about, Paul wasn't idiotic, nor should we be, but we should be faithful to stay the course that God has chosen for us. Listen, man, if you can't stand up to your friends, your co-workers, or your family members who are opposed to the word of God, what makes you think you stand up for Christ under threat from some government? Is this the truth or not? We need to function by facts. Not by feelings. I'm thankful for, for people in our lives, but we need, to, we need to function by the truth of God's word. Paul said, I'm going forward for God. The will of God, the will of God be done. More is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You know, the way may be hard, but the message is worth any difficulty. Share Christ with other people. Set aside your pride, your, your anxiety, and would you, would you commit to do this this week? Between now and next Sunday, would you commit to share Christ with someone? Just give a gospel tract. Say, hey, I would like to invite you to my church. I, I just would like for you to know that Jesus is the Savior. Has anyone ever told you how you can know Christ as your Savior? A ask a question that would, would pique their interest and share, share a gospel tract with them. Hey, would you commit to share Christ with just one soul this week? Just one. Perhaps more. Could you do that? Oh, that's too difficult, preacher. I don't know that I could do that. Friends, you can. Amen. We all can and we all should. In a pamphlet called The Regions Beyond, volume 37, a summary of the life of Adoniram Judson is written. I want to read a paragraph from it for you as we conclude this morning. Adnan Judson was a missionary in Burma. The, the story goes this, says this. Adnan Judson sweated out Burma's heat for 18 years without a furlough. It's amazing. I'm thankful that we can fly our missionaries home uh, almost at a moment's notice if need be. 18 years. Six years without a convert. Enduring torture and imprisonment, he admitted that he never saw a ship sail without wanting to jump on board and go home. When his wife's health broke and he put her on a homebound vessel in the knowledge that he would not see her for two whole years, he confided to his diary, quote, if we could find some quiet resting place on earth where we could spend the rest of our days in peace, and then it tails off. But he then stated himself with this remarkable postscript to that statement. Life is short. Millions of Burmese are perishing. I am almost the only person on earth who has attained their language to communicate salvation. At Nairn Judson, he had a tough path. You know, the fact of the matter is, few if any of us will. 
the difficulties we face face are minuscule in comparison to what Paul faced or what Ed and I and Judson faced. We need to go forward with the gospel of Christ. May the will of God be done in our lives because the gospel is paramount, is eternally significant to every soul on planet earth. Jesus is the one and only Savior. Do you have him? Do you know him? Don't you think he's important enough for us to set aside any pride, anxiety, self-consciousness to share him with someone this week? The Apostle Paul was willing to die and he would give his life a martyr for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Might we at least take a few moments this week and share Christ with someone? We can and we should. May the will of God be done in each of our lives this week. Stay on the path that God has chosen for you. Father, thank you for our time and your word this morning. And Lord, we're reminded again of the resolve of the Apostle Paul. Although he knew he was going to face difficulty, he went forward for you desiring to fulfill your will with his life. Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us to desire likewise. That although there may be some difficulty for obeying your will, that, Lord, we would be faithful to you nonetheless. Lord, help each of us to commit to share you with at least one soul this week. And, Lord, help us to stay on that path that you've chosen for us. We saw some of the examples here in this account Barnabas and Philip and his family. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to you to stay on that straight and narrow path of your choosing, to stay faithful and true to your word. And Father, as always, if there be any among us today that don't know you as our personal Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray you would come. Let us take your word and show them how they can trust you today as their Savior. Help us each one to commit to fulfilling your will for our lives this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand.